Um, my parents are ecological artists and they've been working uh, in the field of sort of what does ecological art mean in some degree they sort of founded it uh, and it's really fits into what we're talking about because as a child I was uh, you know one of the first things I did was I uh, on growing plants in museums because that's what people did in the 70s they just grew the artists a lot of them they grew things and from that conversation growing things came the questions why how what uh, where and early on uh, in that process, and, and I'll go with, through a couple of examples, both large and small, in a second. It became really clear that the really big issues we were facing were really issues of understanding our place in the world, uh, understanding where we were, and, and realizing that we had made we were out of balance with life, and that came first from looking at just the science of life. And the first piece of work that uh, sort of fit in this world was artists sort of asking questions. Why is it? Why is this happening this way? What does this all mean? And one of the first, my first job in junior high school was working in a little marine lab at the campus of the University of California at San Diego building saltwater fish tanks. Why was that? Well, because somebody, uh, a deep friend of ours, who Paul knows, Renil Sonanayaka, had thought that, you know, maybe it might be possible since my parents were growing orange trees and gallows and growing catfish that they might be able to grow a lagoon crab. And that had never been done before. And they sort of imported a bunch of these mangrove crabs and asked, well, why don't crabs produce? And they came up with two questions. Well, a happy crab is going to want to reproduce. So what makes a crab happy? And they then also asked, when do crabs reproduce? Well, they reproduce after the monsoon season. So they asked the simple question, would a crab be happy if we introduced an artificial monsoon into a, into a laboratory test pool? i.e. do you take a garden hose and you in two hours reduce the salinity of saltwater tank by 30 percent? Funny enough, nobody had ever asked that question before and it happened. These crabs started to introduce mating behavior and the scientists over at Scripps Institute of Oceanography were, who were nearby and uh, wanted to find out what these crazy artists were doing came over and suddenly uh, we have the first two artists who ever got a C grant from Scripps Institute floating around. So I bring it up because I think Paul and, and uh, mentioned the notion of empathy. Uh, and I think we also mentioned the notion of perspective and vision. And I think these are all part of what makes this uh, world that I grew up in, which nobody could really describe, but they were people who called themselves artists, but they were working with animals and they were working with landscape and working with rivers and they were working with different things. But somehow it was, it was art and somehow it was bigger than the walls and the museums that it, that, and galleries that it lived in. So, um, with that said, um, let me talk a little bit more. That process eventuated in our founding a center, the Center for the Study of the Force Majeure, um, which is really based on a couple of simple principles, but one that's pretty familiar to this group, which is, you know, we're not a part of nature. We're not apart from nature. We're a part of nature. And that's the contradiction that we've been living in in Western society for a long time. And our challenge really from the center's point of view for, for all of us is how do we get back into balance? How do we get back to understanding we're really part of the system? And we call it the Center for the Study of the Force Majeure, uh, which is a legal term because it's really, Force Majeure is the moment when the insurance company tells you that was a storm and that was too big for us and it's an act of God and we just can't pay for it. So we, we, we basically define it as the, looking at the things we as people have done to ourselves that for which we can't control the outcomes and which have gotten us into a lot of trouble. And, you know, basically by the extraction of fossil carbon and the attitude we have where we, we don't live in a world um, that's reciprocating. In other words, nature 
nature is constantly, uh, you know, any output is somebody else's input. There is no waste, as Paul Mankiewicz is fond of saying in nature, everything, everything's a feedstock for something else. And we as humans have left that behind. And so we look at ways that we can get back together and bring that back into the conversation. And I'd just like to talk about a couple of things that other projects we did historically, one on the ground, very practical where we actually made soil uh, for in, in, in restoring a park. Uh, and the other where we worked on a much larger scale at the uh, province of Holland. And then I'd like to, in the limited time we have, talk a little bit about three active projects that we're working on. And you know, the last one being the one that Paul mentioned a few minutes ago, Leaf Island. But uh, if we have time for that, otherwise we might be able to get to that in the comments. So what does this all mean? What does being sort of crazy artists who don't really fit anywhere, but sort of are dealing with big global things mean? And in the case of Art Park, it meant, um, uh, which was, uh, some of you may be familiar with it, it's a piece of land right at the edge of the Niagara Escarpment. That is to say, it's where the cliffs between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario fall off. And so as long as people have been around, it's been a portage site. And as long, and it's not far because it's not far from Niagara Falls, it also happens to be where the early experiments in electricity and industrial manufacturing. So it's both a historical site, a religious site for all the native peoples who obviously were using that site as a very convenient place of travel and portage. And it was a waste dump. It was the, uh, not, it's about a mile away from Love Canal and Hooker Chemical decided it was, Love Canal was too far away. So they just dump actually on this piece of property. And this sort of state property ended up in state hands. And in the 1960s, they were trying to figure out what to do with this 120 acre property on the edge of the Niagara Escarpment that had some, challenges on landscape. And one of the other challenges that happened was that when uh, Robert Moses built the Niagara Mohawk power plant and then a freeway next to it, they put a bunch of the limestone spoils on this piece of property. So some of it was historical, some of it was toxic waste, some of it was semi-toxic waste. What would they do with it? They came up with this brilliant idea of making it a park and then they couldn't just make it a park. They decided what, because no one in their right mind would go to this thing. So they made it a park for artists. And that's where, um, and they basically invited artists to come in and do things. And that's when we came in um, and I was a, I guess a freshman in college at this point. Um, and we looked at this and what we decided was that we couldn't, what we couldn't just sort of do something and walk away. It didn't really make any sense. And um, I found out, in sort of looking around that the Niagara Mohawk power plant was burying a bunch of its lines and they were looking for um, a place to dump clean earth fill. And so we basically convinced them and convinced six local towns to give us their lead waste and convinced a bunch of apple, uh, apple orchards to give us um, some of their leftover pumice bearing in the ground. Uh, and we got three that we got the uh, the community to deliver 3000 loads of mixed fill and dirt. We got the uh, parks department to volunteer to mix this in the wintertime with, uh, with heavy equipment. And we basically uh, took uh, 3000 acres. I mean, sorry, we took 3000, these 3000 piles and we, we weren't able to make it completely whole, but we turned this limestone source pile into a flowering meadow, which if you visit our park today, you would never know what its history was. So that's a scale, that's a small scale process. Okay, let's go back. Um, moving from the small to the large, um, in the late 1990s, the, the largest presence in the Netherlands, <clears throat> Holland was looking at, uh, how to plan for an expected 300,000 new housing units that they understood they were going to need over the next 10 years. And they went through about eight or 10 plans. Each one got rejected. They went through a public offering, went through about another 30 or 40 public propositions. And the, the Dutch are community oriented and planners. So there's a lot, there were a lot of public meetings. And finally, when no, no one was happy with any solution, they 
gave, they almost threw up their hands and the, one of the local art museums raised its hand and said, why don't we invite these crazy American artists to come in and talk? Um, and uh, so they came in and the basic concept was the Dutch were planning to build sort of a regular grid of housing over what was this mix of wetlands, farms, and run and and green space that was in the, the sort of the central part called the Randstadt. And they were really not thinking about the world that they were living in. And they were and whatever plans they chose were unsatisfactory. So they basically turned the map upside down and said, this is entirely wrong. Let's flip the metaphor. Let's move all the housing to the outside of the city and let's act to the outside of the urban areas. And, oh, sorry, and let's just basically build a ring around the city that went through about 60 or 80 public meetings, gradually got a lot of, it was a very political uh, process as you might imagine, was adopted in principle by the government. Then there was an election and the opposition came in and then it was forgotten. And then five years later, the, the original party got <laughs> reelected uh, and then they brought up the plan again. And then by the mid 2000s, they had basically adopted this as a master plan. So again, it was just an idea. It was a provocation. It was what we might, you know, it was a, first it was started by a provocation. You guys are thinking backwards. Then it turned into a conversation that said, let's talk about it. And then almost on its own, organically, as many of these things, it became an implementation. So, um, so those are sort of two examples of the level of scale and process from very small to very large. And now let's sort of talk about, um, and both dealing with, with land and it's very, uh, intimate ways. Um, and let me just, you know, briefly start, you know, start to sound like I'm going through a, a long list here. I'm happy to talk about any of these in more detail if questions come up. Um, but the um, the next thing that uh, we're doing, one of the projects we, we are working on now quite, quite actively is how do we think about what the future is going to bring? What does the upward movement of species mean as, as heat rises? What does the um, what does the future look like? What can we imagine? And in the level of a garden, can we imagine what a garden of fifty to seventy five years from now might look like? And if we can, can we can we start to implement that? And and the basic insight here is that what we say that every place is the story of its own becoming. That is to say, every place you know, has been warmer, hotter, wetter, drier in different configurations. And if we look uh, through a combination of a historical record and paleobotany, if we look through the local plant communities and for what people are thinking about, we can imagine uh, a test of what that might look like in the future. And we have, uh, we've done this in, Tops of museums and temporary spaces, and we've done this on the landscape in the Sierra Nevada and sort of large, uncontrolled experiments. And we've done this most recently at the um, um, at the uh, Santa UC Santa Cruz Arboretum, uh, in what we call a future garden for the uh, coast of Central California. Again, this was a opportunity to bring native traditions in, to look at community things, and to identify basically what you might call a heroic palette of plants that would look like, might look like they would survive over time, and that could allow us to walk into what the future might be. And again, this ties to some of the conversation that Marietta was having, is how do we bring people back into a more intimate relationship with the world that they're not only living in now, but the world they can expect to live in. And so we were lucky enough to have um, three geodesic domes donated by Allegra Fuller <laughs> to the planet. And we filled each one with a, one is a control group, one, one with a wetter um, future and one with a drier future. Um, and uh, those opened up in the, uh, summer of 2018, and they've become one of the most heavily visited sites on the university campus. And we are in conversations in future gardens and with schools, with Arboreta in various, in Scotland and potentially in Finland and in 
um, other parts of the country. And it's really just the idea is to give people a chance to build their own garden and build their own sense of what the future is wherever they might be. And uh, as long as, you know, they follow through on some of the ideas and, all right. Um, but of course, you know, we're, the idea of gardening isn't really um, limited to things that are in organized spaces like arboreta or parks or, or back, you know, or, or, you know, zoos or, or other things there. Obviously there, the world around us is uh, telling us you know, in certain terms that, uh, you know, we we're out of balance and there's no more visible example uh, in the United States at least of than the massive, massive fires that are um, happening in the West Coast. And I've been particularly working on fires uh, and the process of fire in uh, the last five or six years. And really this, this picture is, you know, if we think about why, you know, what's going on in the forests in the dryland west, uh, particularly in California, which is currently the most severe. Um, this, these are two photos that sort of explain what the real problem is. In the upper left is a photo of, of the Sierra Nevada. And it, in some ways it's a it maps to a lot of images we have when we look at the, we think about forest land, which are large unbroken canopies of trees. And if you look at those trees, you can see they're rather unhealthy because large unbroken canopies of trees take up a lot of resources in the soil and the water that they can't do and become susceptible to disease and other kinds of, of damage. But um, the, uh, and if you look at the lower right, this is an example of the, la the sort of the last healthy ecosystem on the West Coast, which of course is in Mexico in the, uh, spine of San Pedro Martí, National Park of San Pedro Martí, uh, a beautiful spot if you happen to find yourself in central Baja California. Um, and this has never been logged and it's never, and, it natu and fire has existed in its natural state. And the, as, as Paul alluded to, um, in the West Coast, because you have a wet and, you know, you know, the wet winters and dry summers, you have this basically fire adapter forests where the um, fire, the forests need fire to survive. Uh, they need fire for cleaning, cleaning up and purifying the soil. They need fire for heating up the, you know, the seeds to, to, to sprout. They need fire to clean out the brush and the midlands to allow light to come in. They, they need fire for all kinds of reasons. And the, as the glaciers retreated, we also had this, co-inhabitant of the fire, people came in. Um, and so people have existed in the West with fire for as long as fire has been, for as long as fires have been uh, with us. And so they learned how to adapt and direct the uh, course of burning, both on the grasslands and the plains and in the forests. And as a result, they basically, there's a wonderful book called <laughs> Yeah, tending the West, they basically learned how to garden the forests of, of the West. And uh, as the uh, Europeans came in, first the uh, the, the Franciscan, uh, you know, uh, church people up in, you know, in, coming up from the South, coming up from Mexico, the first thing they did was they rounded up the native people into something close to uh, concentration camps uh, for work groups, at least work camps. Um, but the other thing they did was they suppressed, they be immediately started suppressing fire because they were afraid of it. And when they, when after the gold rush came and the, uh, you know, the, the settlers from the U.S. came, they continued that process and they basically banned native knowledge. And we're only now 150 years after the Comstock era is over, coming back to accepting the fact that there's, that fire is really critical and reintroducing fire directly is really important. Very quickly, just to look at the scale of the problem we're at, you know, just California, this, these, this, these numbers are already out of date and they're two, they're two weeks old. Um, you know, it's the largest fire season in record in California, five of the largest fires in history have been ignited. Over 4 million acres burned. That's you know, massively higher than 2019 and twice the, late, the last 
record, which was 2 million acres in California, and that was 2018. Uh, I think the fatalities have gone up since this, uh, this note as well. So we're really in a position where we have to change the way we look at things. And that's one of some of the work that I've, that I've been doing. We have to come up with, you know, essentially, how do we build a regenerative system? How do we build a whole system out of the process? How do we basically create a way of treating our forest land so that, as we say in the center, the forest, the, the harvest preserves the whole, which is a concept of a regenerative forestry mapped to what do you do with the wood? Because of course, wood is heavy. It's got a lot of water in it. It, carries, it takes a lot of of material it takes a lot of energy to move it. How, if, what, basically, the you know you can't just cut it and leave it there, which is what people have been doing now. They figured that they figured out how to they figured the science out that they need to remove uh, small diameter trees largely off of a landscape. But of course, that's not enough. They have to take that small diameter trees uh, and take them somewhere else and do something with them. Of course, that's expensive. So how do you finance it? So there's a process by which you have to look at the entire system of the community. You have to look at how do you, in order to get a healthy forest, you have to have you have to maintain them in a way that promotes their own ecological well-being and their own biodiversity and their own biomass. And if you do that, of course, you get all of these wonderful benefits not only for the natural systems but also for the human systems which rely on them because most of the water that people use in the west whether it's for drinking or farm or, or industrial work comes out of the water that falls on the highlands you know the the amount of you know the, the 2.5 millimeter particles that paul was talking about earlier uh, the amount of black particulate and the health issues of these massive uncontrolled fires have basically wiped out all the virtues of the Clean Air Act in California from the enactment in the 1960s. So we're really, 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 you know, in a situation where we need a system, we need a, we need a, an economy that can, that's regenerative, that promotes the well-being of the people as, who live there as well as the well-being of the land so that you're building place-based work that where the work you do improves the landscape. So the more you work, at what you're doing, the, more, the healthier not only your own personal life is, but the, work, the landscape in which you live in is. And so this is, you know, basically the mission of living forests.